in a paper which he gave at the Geneva International Conference on AIDS, Peter Piot, the then director of UNAIDS, first talked about combination prevention, or the idea that in order to be effective, we have to stop talking about single magic bullet interventions for HIV prevention, but rather adopt a programmatic approach in which a number of different things of proven effectiveness are brought together in synergy with one another. I, like many of you here in Canada, have grown up in a culture in which our health service is organized on a programmatic basis, not on the intervention-focused basis that you see south of the border here, where all of health issues too frequently are reduced to projects or interventions of limited duration funded by different bodies, but fail to have that programmatic coherence overall with the most appalling health consequences which at long last the President of the United States and of course many others are beginning to recognize. But that's what we mean when we talk about combination prevention and this need for a more comprehensive approach. A lot of words I know and maybe too many things to do at once but this is UNAID's current definition of a comprehensive approach grabbed from their website last week. Importantly, though, combination prevention or effective prevention requires us to address at least two, if not more, things. The first of these things is what we can call social vulnerability. And social vulnerability is not the same as individual risk. In order to tackle social vulnerability in the context of an epidemic, we have to look to the social, to the legal, and to the economic environment in which HIV prevention is possible. Vulnerability reduction measures, as they might be called, include things like working to empower young women and girls to influence whether, when, how sex takes place. Because young women and girls in many societies, or indeed in subsections of any given society may lack the power to influence whether, when, how sex takes place. Interestingly, while comprehensive prevention and vulnerability reduction are accepted as principles by many, not many of our countries are willing to take them that seriously. So while the UK, while Canada, and while even the USA now promote comprehensive prevention internationally, they remain rather more coy about adopting such an approach within their own borders. Instead, more usually a far more limited range of options are choose, chosen. Um, and more worryingly, in fact, if we look at the legal sphere, in many countries we're seeing governments substituting laws that used to protect the rights of people living with HIV by laws which criminalize HIV transmission. So we have to keep an eye on the gap sometimes between the rhetoric and the reality within a particular context. But I said earlier that we need to address several different things if we're to be successful in our prevention efforts. And here are just a few of them. Social vulnerability, as I mentioned earlier. Individual risk, which I guess is the factor which is so often addressed in mainstream health education activities that focus upon knowledge, attitudes, and practices. But the impact, too, of HIV on communities, those that are heavily impacted upon may require different measures and different approaches from those in which the appearance of the epidemic is more nascent. And as I mentioned earlier on, issues of generational continuity and change. Those who we're working with today are not the same as those in the past. And those who were in the past may have new needs and find themselves in new circumstances today. So what then are structural approaches? And how can they help us in engaging with those different areas of concern? 
Importantly, while structural approaches can include single policy or programmatic actions to change the circumstances under which people live, they may also take the form of multiple actions implemented simultaneously so as to bring about some form of community transformation or to catalyze some form of social or political change. They may also be applied in combination with individually oriented behavioral interventions and the biomedical interventions which show so much promise at the present time. So it is this combination of factors again that I want to stress that may lay the foundations for success. While structural approaches can result in activities or services being delivered to individuals, they differ from more individually focused approaches by addressing the factors that influence individual behavior rather than targeting the behavior itself. That's a point that I make here. The emphasis is upon the factors that influence individual behavior, the factors which are precursors or, or contextual uh, influences. Let me give you one example. Microcredit programs, which have been trialed in many developing countries, aim to offer a, a service, most usually to individual women, prov by providing them with the capital with which to start small businesses or other income generating activities which enable women's economic vulnerability on men to be addressed whilst also contributing to the well-being of the larger community. So microcredit initiatives, if you like, are one example of a structural approach to intervention which holds the possibility of empowerment, improvements in well-being and the capacity of women in some communities to negotiate whether, when, and how sex takes place. The defining characteristic of structural approaches, though, regardless of whether they're policy or program actions or transformative processes, is that they seek to bring about social mobilization to oppose harmful practices by changing the social, economic, political and environmental factors influencing HIV risk and vulnerability. And interestingly, some of the most successful structural approaches are ones that are already with us, although we may not think of them as structural approaches. Let me just give you one example. The example I choose comes from stringent needle exchange programs for injecting drug users, which are if often simply called stringent needle exchanges but I would want to say they're actually structural interventions and for many of us involved in having to change government's policies as well as the implementation of the law around stringent needle access, there was a lot of work that had to take place there at the policy level, the legal level, the practice level, which was indeed structural in its focus and indeed in its effect. Such approaches are structural because they require a shift in policy in contexts where the possession or use of drugs is illegal. They may also require the reorientation of services away from the notion of cure, for example, to the notion of harm reduction, harm minimization. And they target the drivers of HIV vulnerability in drug using populations as opposed to using education messages alone which do little to impact on the factors that lead to the sharing of needles and syringes. Other examples could come from the 100% condom use programs in the Dominican Republic, in motels, in hotels, where efforts were made to work with hotel managers to provide condoms in the drawers beside every bed, if there was a bed, or to provide them in machines or dispensers elsewhere. The similar programs in Thailand, although if I had more time I would want to talk a little bit about those because they were in no sense 100% and they're not quite like the way they're characterized in the academic literature, but enough of that, but in other countries as well. <laughs> Efforts to engage managers, those who run businesses in activities to make sex safer. Or maybe Program H, Program Homens in Brazil, which worked with young men in Rio de Janeiro in the favelas on the outskirts of the city or indeed above the rich areas of the city to help 
young men reevaluate or to talk more openly about their sense of being a man and how being a man within that context posed risks both to their own physical and mental well-being as well as to that of their girlfriends, be their girlfriends biological women or travestis. That project again produced some quite remarkable success working at a relatively small scale in context that hitherto it was thought impossible to engage with. But it did so by beginning with the structures of everyday life, with the economic disadvantage that those young men experienced, with their lack of access to any form of health services, with their sense of masculinity derived from dominant ideologies about being a man in Brazil. That was the level of the intervention, not knowledge about HIV, a virus, its transmission routes, being nice to women. No, 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 no. Don't start there. Start with the lived realities of grassroots. And finally, another initiative which many of you will know about, the Image Project in South Africa, in Limpopo province, which sought to bring about changes in gender-based HIV vulnerabilities, such as sexual violence, women's economic dependency on men, and women's lack of in-depth information about HIV and transmission. Image addressed these issues by partnering with a local microfinance institution, which is called the Small Enterprise Foundation, to enable women in this context to develop micro-enterprises while also offering HIV education and creating opportunities for participants to discuss and to mobilize local action against gender-based violence. HIV here was part of a bigger whole. The bigger whole was gendered inequality. And that was what engaged the women. The bigger whole was economic disadvantage. And that was what engaged the women and the men in this particular circumstances. And for those of us who are influenced by randomized controlled trials, in a cluster randomized controlled trial, the image initiative showed results by significantly reducing levels of intimate partner violence and improving household well-being, social capital, and empowerment. So the evidence is there. It's reasonably clear concerning the effects and the effectiveness of structural approaches to HIV prevention. But let me sound a note of caution. And this is quite an important notion. When we're operationalizing a structural approach, it's very important to recognize that there is no single blueprint for success. There is no one approach. There is no social magic bullet which will work everywhere regardless of context. Structural approaches have their starting point in the fact that context really does matter. And unless we root what we do in local realities our initiatives will be short-lived or patently ineffective. And let me give you an example of that diversity and how the same intervention, actually be it structural or otherwise, can bring about different effects. Different structural approaches have been used to address the needs of mobile populations, for example. In Burma, improvements in road surfaces reduced transportation times which in turn reduced the number of overnight stops that truck drivers had to make along a particular route, which resulted in decreased rates of HIV infection by sound scientific measures in Burma. You might say, ha ha, the answer is improve the roads everywhere, people will move more quickly, and HIV will decrease. No, I'm afraid not. While this was a useful structural intervention in that context at that time, it will not necessarily produce the same result elsewhere. 